Hello, it's Andrew Firth here, and for the next 40 minutes or so, I will be talking about the area of London's East End made infamous by Jack the Ripper. Each year, thousands of people join one of the many Jack the Ripper walking tours around Whitechapel and Spitalfields. Tour guides take their customers around the streets and alleyways, visiting the sites of Jack's terrible murders, conveying the story almost as if it were fiction. The modern-day locations seem to bear absolutely no resemblance to the gaslit, damp and squalid scenes that the average visitor may have read about. The tour groups come here in a quest for that cinematic imagery of swirling fog, top-hatted murderers, cobbled lanes and the omnipresent horse and carriage. There's none of that here, not now. It's fair to say that in reality there's very little of the Victorian area left to see. In the 1880s, the district was formed of tightly spaced, poorly lit dwellings, with no real sanitation. These overcrowded hovels were built shoulder to shoulder with factories and mills, with chimneys belching out the most acrid of smoke. Infant mortality, poverty and crime affected people on a day-to-day -day basis. It really wasn't a situation that could be allowed to continue. Although it took many years, the reforms to welfare, the various rebuilding programmes, road widening schemes, the impact of two world wars, all of these played their part in changing Jack the Ripper's London pretty much out of all recognition. Let us now take a virtual visit to what remains from those dark days of 1888, so we can see how these East End locations have changed since that time. We start at the location of the first Whitechapel murder, that of Emma Smith, near Osborne Street. Tourists visiting the East End to sample one of Brick Lane's famous curry houses may look upon this short stretch of roadway as being the beginning of the lane. After all, it has its own Asian shops and restaurants, so there's no reason to believe otherwise. But a quick look at a London map will confirm this is Osborne Street, which leads up to a small but very busy crossroads located off in the distance in this view. Here, Osborne Street meets its famous neighbouring lane head-on, with Wentworth Street heading off to the west and Old Montague Street leading off to the east. Emma Smith told police that it was somewhere near to this junction that she had been attacked. Across from the southern end of Osborne Street, the imposing church of St Mary Matfelon used to stand. It was around this area that Emma Smith first noticed the group of men who, shortly afterwards, were to follow and brutally attack her. The original church built here was known locally as the White Chapel, owing to its whitewashed walls, and of course this popular epithet eventually came to represent the whole surrounding area. The church scene here was actually a rebuild completed in 1877, but sadly the new church suffered considerable damage from wartime bombing in 1940, with a direct lightning strike following soon after. After standing as a derelict and increasingly dangerous shell for around 15 years, it was finally demolished in the 1950s. At first glance, today's Royal London Hospital on Whitechapel Road doesn't appear to be very different from the view featured in Jack London's The People of the Abyss. But look beyond the classic frontage, and a vast complex of more modern utilitarian buildings can be seen lurking in the background. It's now one of the main hospitals serving London, and even boasts a helipad for the use of the London Air Ambulance. No such facilities existed in 1888, however, and poor Emma Smith had to make her way here on foot, no doubt in excruciating pain. George Yard, or Gunthorpe Street as it's now known, is well worth seeking out. Despite not being one of the official Jack the Ripper murder sites, the set paved winding lane framed by a dark arch leading from Whitechapel High Street is quite possibly one of the most Ripper-esque scenes left in modern day London. Framed left and right by the White Hart Pub and the old Albert's Tailor's Shop, respectively, the Gunthorpe Street Arch feels almost like a gateway into Ripperland. The welcoming glow emanating from the pub certainly adds to some atmosphere, despite the lighting being electric rather than gas, whilst off in the distance the almost omnipresent spire of Christchurch Spitalfields can be glimpsed. So evocative of the late Victorian period is this view, that some have proclaimed it to be the most photographed Ripper-related scene in the East End. To the casual observer, this is how it looked in 1888. The uneven road sets, the low industrial factory buildings, the unnerving darkness of it all, and yet appearances can be deceptive. On the right, that rather old-looking red brick building, which snakes away into the distance, wasn't here when Martha Tabron met her untimely end at the hands of an unknown assailant on the 7th of August 1888. 
The building is in fact a more modern early 20th century construction, which replaced the ramshackle grime-encrusted St George's Works, which in 1888 had dealt with the manufacture of colouring dyes and varnishes. Passing through the arch, and negotiating a path through the crowds of pub patrons, outcasts since the smoking ban came into force, and Gunthorpe Street opens out considerably. Not the roadway itself, but the space on either side as you leave the arch behind. On the right are some modern apartments, squeezed into the tiniest of spaces for opportunistic developers, before the aforementioned brick building begins to dominate. In contrast, however, on the left, and quite plain to see, is a building that was here in 1888, an old accommodation building displaying the year 1886 etched into the stonework near to the roof line. Heading towards the end of the street, and we reach the site of George Yard Buildings, a block of tenement accommodation, access to this building was obtained through a passageway which, with stairways leading up to a series of communal landings. It was on the first floor landing that Martha Tabram was found at 4.45am on the 7th of August 1888, having been brutally stabbed to death. Back in 1888, the location of the first canonical Jack the Ripper murder was a place of dirt and grime. Rows of small terraced houses lined one side of the street, and opposite stood dark and blank-walled warehouse buildings, which at night would give a very closed-in and oppressive feel to the street. The Industrial Revolution had brought the railways to London, and Bucks Row itself was on the receiving end of the necessary demolition that railway construction entailed. In 1876, the East London Railway Company sought to build their line linking Liverpool Street in the north with New Cross in the south utilising Brunel's Thames Tunnel, originally constructed between 1825 and 1843. The course of the line required the demolition not just of some of the terraced dwellings in Bucks Row, but also of the school that stood where the street widened out at its junction with Winthrop Street, running parallel. The railway cutting was constructed, and alongside this, a brand new board school building was then built. As soon as the trains began to run, the dirty and acrid smoke from the locomotives accumulated on every wall and building it could, dimming what little sunlight penetrated the already filthy air, and blackening windows with soot. At night, the ineffective street lamps with their flickering gas flames did their best to, to guide intrepid locals on their way to work at very unsocial hours of the morning, when particularly in winter, sunrise might not occur for several hours more. When the body of Mary Ann Nichols, known as Polly, was discovered in a stable yard gateway alongside the railway cutting at 3.40am on the 31st of August 1888, it seemed almost as if the killer had wanted to be caught. This was a straight, wide-open street. Should a police officer on his beat have rounded the corner all of a sudden, there would be no apparent hidey holes or alleyways in, in the near vicinity for Jack to secrete himself in. As would prove to be the case with most of the other killings, it was the darkness that was to be the murderer's most faithful ally. The fortunes of the old Bucks Row have improved considerably in recent years. In 1996, the board school building was restored and converted into flats. The Swanley Secondary School was constructed on the northern side of the street, and a Sainsbury supermarket was built at the eastern end. As a result, the whole area became much brighter, healthier, and above all, much safer. At present time, however, construction work on the rebuilding of Whitechapel Underground Station continues to run behind schedule. The site of Mary Ann Nichols' murder has been inaccessible for the last five years, hidden behind construction site boards, and the residents of the old board school building have found themselves living in the middle of a somewhat disorganised construction site. Hanbury Street, the location of the second Jack the Ripper murder, that of Annie Chapman on the 8th of September 1888, has been dominated for centuries by the presence of the nearby brewery of Truman, Hanbury and Buxton. In the Ripper's time, the street boasted several public houses bearing the brewery name, and although it wasn't located on the street itself, the sounds and smells of the brewery would permeate the ears and nostrils of Hanbury Street's inhabitants. At 5.30 on the morning of the 8th of September 1888, Mrs Elizabeth Long was making her way via Hanbury Street to Spitalfields Market. She later said that she was certain of the time, as she had heard the brewery clock on Brick Lane chime the half hour. She saw a man and a woman stood outside number 29 talking loudly. As Elizabeth passed, she heard the man say, Will you? To which the woman replied, Yes. 
Mrs Long was later to identify the woman she had seen as Annie Chapman, and so this sighting must have been only a matter of minutes before she was murdered in the damp backyard of number 29. The line of rather ramshackle houses, of which number 29 was one, miraculously survived until the 1960s, but the inevitable demolition came in 1970, when the brewery complex expanded once more, and a rather ugly bottling plant was built in its place. This concrete and dark brick structure, with a zigzag profiled roof, is a particularly ugly building, lacking in any real architectural merit. It was built to serve a purpose. There were certainly no considerations given as to whether it was aesthetically pleasing or in keeping with the rest of Spitalfields. Today the bottling plant still stands and during the week is used as a private car park, but it is at weekends when the building comes alive. The Sunday Up Market is held here, with stalls selling spicy and unusual foods, ready to eat if you so choose, on the site of Annie Chapman's murder. Around the corner in Brick Lane, Mrs Long's clock still survives, along with a carved stone eagle crest on the face of one of the old brewery buildings. And towering above, acting as a very useful navigational landmark, is the tall brick chimney of the brewery, still proudly displaying the legend Truman's on its side. The brewery may have been closed for nearly 30 years, but there's a considerable buzz to the whole complex. Fashionable clothes shops, restaurants, craft shops, and even a music store selling an eclectic mix of vinyl and CDs have all helped to ensure a continued flow of visitors to the area. For the walking tours, however, there's nothing left of number 29, and so groups tend to stop only briefly, pointing out where the building used to stand, before moving on to the much more ripper-esque parallel streets nestling in the shadow of Christchurch. Burner Street is very easy to miss, particularly if you're heading in or out of London on the great wide highway that is Commercial Road. The huge expanse of the former main route to the docks, built with a generous width to accommodate the considerable goods traffic of the time, is in stark contrast to this tiny side street that runs off it, today known as Henrika Street. A 1960s office block refaced and refurbished in the late 1990s, casts a gloomy shadow over the northern end of this quiet but notorious street. Originally aligned with ramshackle terraced housing and the occasional stable yard, nowadays the majority of the street is taken up with the buildings and playground of the Harry Gosling Primary School. The red brick building has had a number of modern extensions built to it in recent years, but the original structure dates from as far back as 1909. As is well known, Burner Street, and specifically Duckfield's Yard, was the location of the murder of Elizabeth Stride on the 30th of September 1888. But amongst the five canonical victims of Jack the Ripper, this particular killing stands out. Opinion is divided as to whether this was a Ripper killing at all, or merely the result of an opportunistic but violent drunken brawl. Elizabeth's throat had been cut, but there were no abdominal mutilations, as per the previous two murders in Bucks Row and Hanbury Street. Had the killer been disturbed during this murderous frenzy? Some believe so, and having been unable to satisfy his bloodlust, he went on to murder Catherine Eddowes in Mitre Square, just over 45 minutes later. Other students of the case say that the well-documented disturbance outside the yard between a man and a woman only minutes before Stride's body was found provides the explanation, a fight that went too far, fueled by excessive amounts of the demon drink. The considerable changes that have been meted out on the murder site since 1888 can be said to have started here. For 20 years or so, an intrepid visitor could seek them out, finding them relatively unaltered. But the first large-scale redevelopment of a ripper site, something we're now becoming more and more accustomed to in, in the 21st century, was to see the whole western side of Burner Street, including Duckfield's Yard, demolished to make way for the school. Today, the spot where Elizabeth Stride was murdered is no longer directly accessible to the public. A high wall broken only by three imposing but elegant modern arched gateways ceased to that. To the uninitiated, it's tempting to imagine that the southernmost of the gates actually marks the site of the entrance to Duckfield's Yard, but in reality this particular gate crosses the site of the International Working Men's Club building. It's actually the blank section of wall to the left that crosses where the yard used to be. Coincidentally, the footprint of the old yard entrance lines up almost exactly with the disabled parking bay marked out in the playground. There really isn't much left of the old Burner Street now. One sole terraced shop stood amidst the remnants of its demolished neighbours until it too came down a few years ago. Now only the former tobacconist's shop at the junction with Commercial Road still remains. 
It has seen various changes of use over the years and is now a clothes shop, but it's still possible to imagine witness Louis Deemschutz only seconds away from discovering poor Elizabeth's body, rounding the corner into Burner Street and checking the time on the clock in the tobacconist's window. The dominant building on today's Henricus Street is the primary school, built over the site of Duckfield's Yard, but had the old buildings from 1888 survived, they would certainly have helped to retain some of the former character of the street. Using the well-known 1909 daytime photo of Burner Street, we can get an idea of how the murder site of Elizabeth Stride might have looked during a 21st century night. The Mitre Square that P.C. Watkins would have known in 1888 was worlds apart from the scene we see today. Only 70 to 80 feet along each side, this small set paved courtyard will be a bustling place by day, with delivery carts and customers going to and from Messrs Horner and Company, and also to Williams and Company. Much traffic was generated by the warehouse of Keely and Tong, which dealt with the importation and wholesale of tea and spices. By the entrance to the square, but facing onto Mitre Street, was the picture frame shop belonging to Mr Taylor, the back windows of which would overlook the site of the murder. By night, the square would have taken on a completely different character. The grime-encrusted warehouses stood in the icy near darkness, bereft of customers, with only George Morris, a retired policeman and now the night watchman at Keeley and Tong, going about his business, guarding the company's stocks of edibles from theft or damage. Three rather ineffective gas lamps made a hissing sound that was as gentle as the light they gave out. A lamp at the end of Church Passage did its best to illuminate the narrow walkway, but for the most part only gave out a pale yellow pool of light directly below it. The only lamp in the square itself was some distance away from the murder site. The gas fitting was faulty and so gave no real illumination of any kind. The third lamp, fixed to the wall of Williams and Company's premises, was, however, in full working order, but the reach of its light was cut short by the corner of the picture shop on Mitre Street, plunging the murder site into a triangle of almost total darkness. At regular intervals throughout the night, P.C. Watkins would enter the square on his beat, his steady, almost metronomic footsteps echoing around the square as he cast his bullseye lamp into the gloomiest corners where the gaslight failed to reach. P.C. James Harvey, on his beat around Houndstitch and Bevis Marks, would also regularly visit Mitre Square, pacing along Church Passage as far as the lamp, but would then turn on his heels and return to Duke Street to continue on his way. His watch didn't cover the square. On the northwest side, close to the spluttering and popping faulty lamp, was St James's Passage, a murky arched corridor 55 feet in length, which led to the adjacent St James's Place, known colloquially as the Orange Market. This too was a small enclosed square, almost a mirror image of its neighbour, and towering above it were the same dark and grimy buildings that dominated Mitre Square. This was a true ripper-esque network of unlit passages, concealed hidey holes and blind corners. No matter that two police officers were confidently patrolling their beats in the vicinity, that George Morris was sweeping the ground floor at Keeley and Tong with the main door out into the square open, that people asleep in nearby dwellings could have awoken at any time, alerted by hurrying footsteps or a muffled cry. No one saw a thing after Catherine and her killer entered the square. This was where Jack the Ripper committed his most horrifying murder up to that point, brutally cutting short the life of Catherine Eddowes before slipping away into the night, completely unseen. Mitre Square was a murderous paradise. Fast forward 130 years, and after the nightly throngs of tour groups have left, what is the 21st century Mitre Square actually like? It's fair to say that there really is nothing remaining from 1888. One by one, the buildings that had enclosed the square in an almost oppressively claustrophobic way were torn down. By the late 1970s, the last of the Keeley and Tong buildings had gone, and construction soon began on a replacement. Known as Priory House, it was a stark white nine-storey office block, which was completed by the close of the decade. With the total remodelling of the area, Catherine's exact murder site now lay across a kerb leading towards the access gates of the Sir John Cass School its playground filled with happy children, blissfully unaware that they were playing games only a few feet away from a murder site. Visit the square today and you'll see that everything has changed again. Priory House came down, after only just over 30 years, to be replaced by a new towering office scheme somewhat unsuited to such a small space. The 18 floors of cold metallic grey beams dwarfing the small square and proving a somewhat ugly contrast with the adjacent school. 
Once the construction teams had moved out, the modern sets of the square were removed to be replaced by the usual bland corporate landscaping that could already be seen right across the city. The old narrow passageway leading to St James's Place was now a vast canyon running under the new building. Thankfully the course of Church Passage still remains. Although the size and dimensions of the newly constructed plaza may not have changed too much, the only lasting quality that this small area has held on to after so long is the blanket of eerie quiet that covers Mitre Square after dark, a kind of calm after the storm of such a violent and notorious past. At 2.55am, just over an hour since the murder, PC Alfred Long 254A was working on his beat through the darkened thoroughfare of Goulston Street when he noticed something unusual in the doorway of 108 to 119 Wentworth dwellings. A torn and dirty piece of, of material, stained with what appeared to be blood, lay in the stairway entrance leading to the upper floors. Above this, chalked on the wall tiling, were the cryptic words, The Jews are the men that will not be blamed for nothing. The piece of material was subsequently matched to the remainder of Catherine Eddowes' apron that she'd been wearing when she was murdered. The killer had left his first real clue. He had left Mitre Square and had headed east, stopping here to discard the piece of apron before heading back into the heart of Ripperland, where he evaded capture and went back into hiding once again. Dorset Street is no more. For such a well-known roadway, so central to life throughout several hundred years of history in Spitalfields, it really is a shame to note that there's nothing left of it now. Visitors to the area today have a difficult job finding the site of the fifth check of murder, that of Mary Jane Kelly. In recent years, any last remaining trace of Dorset Street has been wiped off the map, so now rather than looking for traces of the street itself, we need to instead seek out reference markers still extant in order to pinpoint its location. Markers such as Spitalfields Market, the former Queen's Head Pub, Christchurch Spitalfields and the Providence Row Refuge Building all still stand and allow us to plot where the worst street in London used to run. With the passing of the years, the street that had been the location of the Ripper's most atrocious murder saw a process of gradual demolition. First in 1904, almost as if it was an easy way to forget the past, the street was renamed Duval Street. This didn't alter the fact that to all intents and purposes everything else stayed the same. The instances of robbery and murder continued sporadically right up until the 1960s. In 1928, the north side of the street, including the small rented rooms of Miller's Court, all came crashing down as part of a demolition to make way for a new fruit and wool exchange building, forming part of the Spitalfields Market Complex. The south side went the same way in the late 1960s, to be replaced by a multi-storey car park. But even after this time, the market building still needed vehicle access for deliveries and collections, and so right up until 2015, a strip of roadway between Crispin Street and Commercial Street still ran past where Miller's Court had once stood. This unnamed road roughly followed the line of the old Dorset Street, although on a slightly different alignment. With the advent of satellite mapping services, it became possible to calculate the exact spot on the service road where the entrance to the court had once stood. The site of Mary Jane Kelly's bed coincided with a vertical support column on one of the market building's loading bays. But nothing stays the same in London, and by 2016 the multi-storey car park and all but the Art Deco frontage of the Fruit and Wool Exchange building were being demolished to make way for a new development of offices and shops. Although I didn't realise it at the time, this would be the last photograph I would ever take of the former Dorset Street. As the demolition crews tore down the White's Row car park, followed by the Fruit and Wool Exchange, the line of the service road became less and less distinct, as its course was blurred and then completely concealed by rubble. Seconds after I had taken this shot, the sight gates were closed. Upon returning the following year, I was greeted by the melancholy sight of the lift and stairway tower of the new building rising out of the site. Constructed directly across the course of the old street, this single structure once and for all severed the line of the street that had been first laid out as long ago as 1674. There had been over eight months of uneasy calm since the murder of Mary Kelly. With the lack of any further killings, slowly but surely the East End began to return to some semblance of normality. As time went on, new tenants moved into 13 Miller's Court and McCarthy's Chandler's shop continued to trade, staying open until late each night, as it had done for many years. At about 12.50am on the 17th of July 1889, 
Isaac Lewis Jacob set out from his home at number 12 Newcastle Place to go and buy some food for his supper at McCarthy's. As he approached the dimly lit Castle Alley, he spotted a police constable who called him over. PC Walter Andrews, 272H, asked him where he was heading to and to account for his being in the alley. Andrews had just discovered the lifeless body of 40-year-old Alice Mackenzie only moments before, lying on the pavement just south of the Whitechapel washhouses. Her throat had been cut and it was looking likely that Jack the Ripper was back at work again after a lengthy winter hiatus. The alley had already an unenviable reputation for petty crime and violence, which was rife in the small, densely packed houses and narrow passageways. At its southern end, it narrowed down to a small archway leading to Whitechapel High Street, very similar in style to the one that still remains today at Gunthorpe Street. Heading north, the roadway widened out alongside the still extant arch-windowed frontage of the wash houses. A dog-leg turn in the road alongside the Three Crowns pub led to a much wider area known as Old Castle Street, this being the name now given to the entirety of the modern road. The immediate area around Castle Alley was very much hemmed in with plenty of bolt holes to hide away in should any criminal need somewhere to go to ground. Certainly when PC Andrews found Alice's body, it was likely that her assailants had not long left the scene, but in the surrounding network of poorly lit courtyards and passageways, branching off from Castle Alley and neighbouring Goulston Street, the killer was nowhere to be found. As might be expected, if you visit Old Castle Street today, the scene that will greet you has very little in common with 1880s Whitechapel. At the southernmost end, rather than being confronted with a sinister arched passageway, a branch of the ubiquitous Costa Coffee now welcomes you. If you visit on a Sunday, the northern end of the street will often be blocked off by the famous Petticoat Lane Market, its lines of stalls selling cheap clothing and counterfeit designer label goods, the stalls stretching past Goulston Street and away towards Middlesex Street and the city. The spot where Alice Mackenzie was found, however, is often quiet, despite the bustle of neighbouring streets. The high walls of the adjacent university buildings give a cold, oppressive feel and make it a place to pass through rather than one to linger at. Although it is more likely to have been one of the series of Thames torso murders rather than a Jack the Ripper crime, the discovery of the remains of an unidentified woman on the 10th of September 1889 in Pynchon Street is often included in the series of Whitechapel murders, if only because of the location's proximity to the other murder sites. What sets this case apart, however, is that the modus operandi is distinctly different, there being actual decapitation rather than the mutilation normally associated with the Ripper. Another very important point to consider is that, like Osborne Street in the case of Emma Smith, Pynchon Street isn't actually a murder site as such. In this instance, the unfortunate victim was killed elsewhere, and a headless upper torso and arms were dumped here afterwards. After medical examination, it was estimated that the woman had been dead for two days, bringing the date of, of the murder to 8th of September 1889, exactly one year since the murder of Annie Chapman in Hanbury Street. Although theories have emerged over the ensuing years as to the victim's identity, she was never positively identified, and her remains were buried in the East London Cemetery in a sealed metal casket filled with preservative to facilitate identification should any new information ever come to light about who the victim was. Today, Pynchon Street still has a very run-down and industrial feel to it, but the modern housing on the northern side of the street is respectable enough, the type of social housing you would expect to see in a London borough such as Tower Hamlets, built in the 1970s and 1980s on land devastated by wartime bombing. At the eastern end, an old warehouse bearing the legend Pynchon and Johnson 1859 still stands, now of course converted into luxury flats. The line of railway arches on Pynchon Street's southern side no longer carry trains. The clearly discernible sound of railway activity comes from the adjacent line into Fenchurch Street. These arches once carried a spur line into the long-gone goods facilities built near to the junction of Goodman's Style and Commercial Road, but now they stand disused and overgrown. The arch where PC Pennett made his terrible discovery has long since been bricked up and is now the premises of a private business. The four dark windows set into the arch do not penetrate the gloom in, in which the torso of this most forgotten of victims was found. It was a deceptively tranquil name for such a dark and sordid place. A narrow footpath running under a brick railway arch with just a couple of gas lamps, one at either end, was all that Swallow Gardens really amounted to. Nothing about it could be termed as rural, pastoral or even green, save for the moss growing amongst the rough lines of brickwork. 
This was the scene of the last of the series of the Whitechapel murders, that of 25-year-old Francis Coles. The name Swallow Gardens couldn't have been more inappropriate, and yet it wasn't always so. Old maps of London, many of them semi-pictorial in nature, showed the area to be populated with lines of small cottages adjacent to fields bordered by trees. This, then, was the origin of the Swallow Gardens, referred to. The tranquil scene wasn't to last, however, and in 1840, along came the railways. The London and Blackwall Railway, constructing its line into Fenchurch Street, developed an arched viaduct that obliterated everything in its path. In 1891, Swallow Gardens was nothing more than a shortcut for pedestrians and carts belonging to the railway company, running as it did from Chambers Street on the north side of the viaduct to Royal Mint Street on the south. The path occupied only one half of the arch, with the easternmost half in use as a storage facility for a tile maker. That part was fenced off from the public. In addition to the snaking brick viaduct itself, there was a considerable area of land to the south of the railway, given over to a goods yard and a distinctive red brick hydraulic accumulator tower. It was at around 2.15 on the 13th of February 1891 that PC Ernest Thompson, 240H, was walking his beat along Chambers Street. He was relatively new to the police force, and this was his first night out patrolling a beat without being accompanied by a fellow officer. He heard distant footsteps running away from him, and ventured into Swallow Gardens to investigate. He later stated, When I turned into the passage, I could see the woman lying under the arch on the roadway, about midway under the arch. I turned my lamp on as soon as I got there. I could not see it was a woman until I turned my lamp on. I noticed some blood. I saw her open and shut one eye. I blew my whistle three times. Francis had been out drinking most of the previous day, the majority of it spent with Thomas Sadler, a 53-year-old sailor. Sadler was later arrested for her murder, but was considered to have been too inebriated to have committed the crime, and was subsequently cleared. Despite the passing of nearly 18 months since the previous Ripper-style murder, the newspapers were quick to claim the killing of Francis Coles was another Jack Ripper outrage. The killing is unlikely to have been Jack's work. Several coins were found concealed behind a drainpipe recess in the archway, an indication that Francis may have robbed a potential client, and that this had led to an ugly altercation ending in her death. If you head eastward along Chambers Street today and pass under the last of the rusting remnants of the old goods depot bridge, you'll draw alongside the arch that was once Swallow Gardens. In use for many years as a business lock-up, the arch is now obscured by wooden construction site boards. This whole area is now fenced off, a work in progress as the next development of luxury flats is built on the other side of the railway. The artist impressions of Royal Mint Gardens, as it will be known, show a mixture of high-rise flats with high prices to match, alongside shops and cafes at ground level. One picture shows Chamber Street with the former Swallow Gardens arch converted into a glass-fronted retail unit. It may be soon possible to visit the spot where Francis Cole's short life came to an end, but you may need to pay for a latte or a cappuccino if you wish to sit down for some quiet reflection. And so, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our brief journey around the east end of Jack the Ripper. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments section and I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you.